So this is Unit 8, Lecture 2. We're going to talk about mood disorders. Last time we talked about, get Poppy, little girls down here. Last time we talked about um, an intro to disorders. We talked about what disorders are. We talked about, I'm sorry, she's just so cute. No, you're so cute. Come here, big, my big puppy. This right here. You want to get rid of depression. You got to have one of these. And again, it's actually true that studies will show you a way to alleviate depression and anxiety is to get a dog, assuming they're not as crazy and as fat as just one as usual fat. Um, but unconditional love is what they give you. They give you someone to talk to, very loyal, right next to me the whole time, big snorter. But this is a way to uh, alleviate it. So last time we talked about anxiety, we talked about uh, disorders. And again, a disorder means that it gets in the way of your day-to-day -day life. It gets in the way of your day-to-day -day life. So uh, we talked about anxiety. And one of the big things with anxiety was not knowing when it was going to hit. And you go through the process of stress and everything else, and you have these anxiety attacks. Uh, the other side of that coin here is, uh, sure good, is uh, depression. And depression, where anxiety is high, high energy. Depression is very low energy, um, where you feel like you can't do anything. Uh, again, my wife uh, has suffered from uh, depression. Let me go ahead and get to the next slide here. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you a little of her story. Um, and this is a story she used to come and tell my students on what was her or what was their favorite day of the year. Uh, I bust my butt for 59 lectures, but <laughs> she shows up for one day and gives a little talk. And it was always the thing that kids uh, remember the most. Uh, she doesn't do it anymore. She did it for the first, she did it for about five or six years. And it was very healthy for her because it got it out, got her to deal with it and everything else. But then after that, it was kind of like picking at a scab and sort of revisiting what she didn't need to revisit anymore because she had kind of worked it out. Um, but she would describe depression. And the way that uh, she described depression is um, numbness. It's numbness. And that's what we're going to chat about, exactly what depression is here in a little bit. Because um, mood disorders are psychological disorders characterized by emotional extremes and challenges, and especially in regulations of moods. And moods are fine. We all have moods, good moods, bad moods, whatever else. But mood disorders tend to be long term, not really a reason for them and things like that. So again, we're going to talk major depressive disorder. And we're going to talk about bipolar disorder, which was formerly manic depressive disorder. And we'll talk about why that's the case. So when we talk about major depressive disorder, we're talking about a mood disorder in which a person for no apparent reason experiences two or more weeks of depressed moods, feelings of worthlessness, diminished interest, or pleasure in most activities. Now we say for no apparent reason. Sometimes there is a reason, there's a trigger, there's something that sort of launches it. But the depressive reaction tends to be greater than sometimes the trigger that caused it. You know, most of us, if we had to move uh, to another town, you know, it, it'd be hard and we'd be sad and we'd be upset, but eventually we pick ourselves up by our bootstraps and we move on. Uh, depression, it's a little bit harder to do, you know, because we all have bad days, but when the bad day becomes a bad week, the bad week becomes a bad month, the bad month becomes a bad year, that year becomes a bad decade, uh, that it gets a little bit more than that. You know, when sadness and grief extend beyond the links of norms and become disruptive. And by the way, depression is not necessarily sadness because sadness is a feeling and an emotion. My wife has always described depression as a numbness. Uh, food doesn't taste as good. Uh, sunshine is not as bright. Uh, things that used to give you joy and pleasure are just sort of eh, there. Um, just things aren't as funny as they used to be. And it just, it takes every bit of your energy to just do 
anything, the simple things to get out of bed and just get dressed. And we can all have lazy days, but it's just such an effort. And this is also why sometimes people who suffer from depression are people who are walking around smiling all day, because as long as they smile, no one's going to ask them what's wrong, you know? And, and, and so a lot of the energy of what depressed people do is put on this facade uh, to sort of hide it. Uh, it affects five to 10% of Americans per year. It's the number one reason that people seek mental health treatment, but they're usually seeking it late because they have hit such a point of uh, hopelessness. Uh, women are twice as likely as men. One fifth of people at some point in their life will be diagnosed. Average age of the first treatment isn't until 32. Uh, because prior to that, you know, you think you're just being a teen, whatever. 75% uh, of cases of depression also involve anxiety uh, as well. And sometimes you're anxious because of your depression. Uh, major depressive signs, again, you don't feel hopeful or happy about anything. The world is moving in slow motion. Your senses are diminished. Nothing tastes good. Nothing smells good. Nothing feels good. Any daily routine of, again, just getting up and taking a shower is just so much effort. So why even do it? You know, hopelessness, guilt, just emotionally disconnected because you don't have the time or the energy to deal with people. Uh, to feel down is normal from time to time, but when it becomes maladaptive, this is when it becomes depression. Some people may be in depression, but they're unaware of it because it evolves slowly. It creeps up. It's like, you know, watching hair grow. You know, most of us don't realize changes that are happening to us because we see ourselves in the mirror every day. But it's the it's the relative we hasn't haven't seen for six months that goes, oh, wow, you look different. You know, so sometimes our friends can't see it because it's a slowly evolving thing and the symptoms could develop at different times. A lot of times we don't want to admit we're depressed. We're in denial of it. It can't be me. It's not happening to me. Or especially if you're a teenager. Sometimes your parents don't want to admit that you're depressed because if I admit that my child has depression, that makes me feel like a failure as a parent. So they might be a little bit hesitant to get help. And again, it looks different amongst different people. And sometimes we rationalize why we're feeling the way we are. And thankfully, now people are more likely to get help uh, for depression. Um, my wife experienced her first real uh, experience with depression was back in 84, 85. She was, um, I want to say she was 16, 15, 16 at the time. She was going into her sophomore year of high school. Um, and uh, sadly, what happened to her is she hung out with this group of friends, whatever, uh, hung out for the summer. She worked at a golf course, country club, whatnot. And there was this guy that wanted to date her. Um, and she's like, no, let's just be friends. And then he got into this frustration, aggression we talked about before, if I can't have you, no one will uh, sort of thing. Uh, and, as a, uh, and then what happened was she was, uh, she was raped uh, by this guy. She was sexually assaulted by this guy. And as with most girls who are victims of this at a very young age, um, you don't want to tell anybody about it and it sort of keeps you inside and it was so sad so sad on so many levels but she's a happy go lucky girl and everything else and now she had this thing that she was hiding and of course this guy doesn't get reported so he just sort of keeps harassing her and making her life terrible and she also was on she lived in wyoming at the time and she was on a ski team and she got into an accident, blew out her ACL. Uh, and so then she was on crutches. So she's feeling helpless. It's winter time. So there's no sun out. And now there's this guy that's basically harassing her. She's not reporting it. Um, her knee gets better. He still harasses her. It's the following spring. It's basketball season. And for some reason or another, they're in the same area. And he threw her down a flight of stairs, bruised up her back, doesn't want to tell anyone. Finally, uh, she's getting changed because she played basketball and she's getting changed and she had these bruises all over her back and the coach saw it and they said, hey, we're going to have to call Child Protective Services thinking she's being abused at home. So finally, she has to come forward with it. And when she came forward with it, 
and told her parents for the first time, her mother's first reaction was, what would you do to cause this? So she went from the guilt of the sexual assault that happened, you know, why me, why is this happening to me? And of course, also being a very um, attractive girl as well, um, she would constantly be harassed and, and by guys, uh, which is why to this day, she has a distrust of guys. I don't know how I slipped in. Uh, but when her mom reacted that way, she's like, wow, I didn't do anything. Why would you think I did anything? So, you know, in this sort of feeling of why am I getting blamed for something I was the victim of, that kind of led to her, well, why fight anything? Why even try? Why even attempt? And it led to her first depressive state. Now, again, the trick is, is when she's going through this in 84, 85, as a teenager, you don't think of teens as being depressed. You're just being a teen. But in retrospect, this was absolute depression. Because again, most of us, if you take a look at the green here, we have good days and we have bad days. You know, we have good times and bad times. And we need good times and bad times. You know, you need bad times. You need bad days because bad days make you appreciate the good days. And then good days prove to you that the bad days will eventually pass. It's great. Depressed people can have good days and they do have good days, but then their bad becomes far worse than other people's bad. And it tends to last longer than other people's bad. And then it's down here when you get into the deep, deep depths of it where you just feel like I can't do nothing. So again, people think it's sadness, but it's more nothingness and numbness and self-loathing and some anxiety and isolation and guilt and hopelessness is sort of what is uh, depression. Um, and as a typical, I don't know why this is making sound here, as a typical teen, uh, you know, she sort of decided to uh, strike out a little bit. Uh, now, again, it's not really what are causes of it because some of it is biological. Some of it is uh, the way that we think and low self-esteem and low self-worth. Some of it is uh, triggered by a trauma, but whether it was this trauma of being sexually assaulted or anything else, there could have been some other trigger. Uh, and again, she's someone who has gone through this at various stages of her life. Now, uh, oh, let me go back here uh, to this right here. Nearly half of patients with depression are not receiving any treatment for their depression. 48% are not receiving any uh, 32% receive less than what's adequate. Only about 20% of people with depression are actually receiving what they need to. Sorry for that noise there. Uh, so when it comes to uh, depression, there's also what is called a dysthymic disorder. And a dysthymic disorder is sort of going into depression and having a hard time getting out of it. 50% of people or 40% of people with depression are never going to see it again. You know, 40% of people who go through a depressive episode, and I'm talking a real, not just sadness, but a real major depressive episode, uh, will never see it again because they'll uh, sort of get the help they need or they'll change their lifestyle or they'll change, you know, the thing that caused it or the environment or whatever else the case may be. 50% of people who face depression uh, are, are likely going to face it again. Because first off, you're biologically predisposed for it. And secondly, a lot of people don't make changes in their life. They stay in the bad relationship. They stay with the bad job. They live in the same depressing environment. And since you don't make these changes, if you don't make any sort of changes and expect different results, it's not going to happen. It's absolutely not. And 10% of people, when they hit a level of depression will sort of stick in it and not quite get in. Now, it's not going to go to the deep, deep depths, depths of it, but it's just this sort of continued haze. But again, very, 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 very rare that that in fact happens. Now, when it comes to depression and creativity, depression and creativity, those people who are creative are more likely to suffer from depression. And the reason is, as a creative person, you know, 
we've all been assigned that paper or whatever, and you get that and it's a blank page and you got to fill it up. And even when you complete something, again, it's another blank canvas. And then there's always the, the trick of, will people like this? Will they like this next thing? If we go over here and we take a look at the odds of getting any disorder, writers, artists, composers are much more likely than a scientist or a member of the general population. And when it comes to depression, writers, artists, and composers, again, the odds of them facing it as opposed to a scientist or the general population is significantly higher because being in that creative sort of aspect, not to mention that, you know, people who face suppression are much more likely, you know, writers, artists, composers have to peel the onion to get to that inspiration or whatever else is going through your life. Now, when it comes to depression, let me make myself tiny here. When it comes to depression, it's not a death sentence. That's the key thing. You can have depression and have a very, very successful life. If you take a look at these people right here, these are famous people who have all been diagnosed with depression, have gotten help, and have gone public with it. Now, of course, more than this, but these are just celebrities. I put up people whose names you probably are familiar with and uh, people who've gone public with it. So if we start up here, this is uh, Buzz Aldrin and uh, talk about the end all be all with Buzz Aldrin. I mean, he does all the training and everything else and he's the second guy to walk on the face of the moon. You know, forget about Collins who's circling. He's the second guy. I mean, Armstrong there, one step for man, schools are named after him. Buzz the second has suffered from uh, depression all of his life and alcoholism and all these other things. Uh, all he ever had named after him was a uh, Pixar character, which I think is way cooler. You know, give me Buzz Lightyear all day. Um, but yeah, he's one. Woody Allen, Alec Baldwin, Christian Bale, Halle Berry, Kirsten Bell, John Bon Jovi, Justin Bieber, Beyonce, um, Drew Barrymore, Jim Carrey, um, almost called her Monica Geller. Um, Courtney Cox, Miley Cyrus, Dave Chappelle, Larry David, Ellen DeGeneres, Johnny Depp, Eminem, uh, Chris Evans, if I'm not mistaken, Harrison Ford, James Franco, Lady Gaga, John Hamm, Anne Hathaway, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, um, Angelina Jolie, Heath Ledger, Nicki Minaj, Trevor Noah, Conan O'Brien, Dolly Parton, Gwyneth Paltrow, Katy Perry, Matthew Perry, uh, Michael Phelps, Brad Pitt, Prince Harry, Bruce Springsteen, um, Gwen Stefani, T.I., Mike Tyson, Kerry Washington, Reese Witherspoon, um, Owen Wilson. Now, again, when you look at a lot of these people, they're all creative. They're all incredibly successful, but all of these people battling depression. Because again, once you create something, can I create the next thing? You know, these people with Twitter accounts, social media, where most people are on there just completely ripping you. You know, you're real, you see that. Can I ever top the next thing? It's, it takes an incredible amount. And I highly recommend you catch any of these people on a podcast where they're talking about depression. It's really amazing. And a lot of time it's because they hold their feet to the fire. These are all very smart people, very intelligent people, very successful people that have made the best of their lives with it. It is not something where you have to go, well, that's it. I can't be successful. I can't do anything. Take a look. That's the face of depression. And the other reason I want to show you these faces, and I know a lot of people are focusing on Heath Ledger. Yeah, but after the Joker, then he killed him or he overdosed. And okay, there are tragic stories, of course. But, but there's also tremendous stories of success unbelievable stories of success. And again, I want to show you these faces of success and these smiles on their faces because we always think of that person with depression in bed, blanket over the head, can't get out. But it's not. And it's one of the reasons why I wish I could bring my wife uh, to school uh, to go over this, except I don't want to put her through it anymore. Uh, you know, to do it six times a day, twice a year. It, 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 just, it just got a little much for her. But she's the face of depression. You can have a successful life. You can maintain 
a successful life and sort of keep this beast tamed. And as long as your life is good. And again, my wife has not had a depressive episode in 10 years, 11 and a half years since we've been married. No, and her, her prescription level medication is even going down because she's taken control of her life. She's dealt with this. She's written. She's dealt with all of her issues. She's in a supportive relationship. So if you make changes and you take control of it, you can definitely handle this and other folks right there. Now, seasonal affective disorder. This is when depression happens to hit in the winter months. Down south, we don't see it as much. Sometimes there's a summer depression because the heat's so bad, we can't go outside, whatever, but we still get plenty of light. Winter depression is more common in the north as you see the numbers are greater up here, the further north you go, because what happens is not only do you get the cold weather, which is bad, and a lot of people go, well, snow is great. I love snow. Really, when we got like a week of it, the power was out. Did you really love that snow? And the other thing about snow is it's great when it shows up. But after a few days and salt is on the road and cars lose their color and the skies are just gray, winters are not grand, especially when you think the winter is going to go away and then suddenly it's snowing in April. Um, you don't like it. Then on top of that, the earth is tilted, so your days are shorter up north. If you've ever lived up north and it's winter time, you know, you live in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan, New York, it gets dark at like 4.30, 5 o'clock. It's already dark. So your days are shorter. You're not getting as much sunlight as you are in the south or as you do in the summertime. And this can greatly have an impact on you. When asking people, have you cried today? They called people and they said, have you cried today? 4% of men and 7% of women said there was something during the day that made them cry. When asked in December, have you cried today? 8% of men, 21% of women. So for guys, it doubled. For women, it tripled. This is seasonal affective disorder. And again, I might have mentioned this before, but it's worth repeating the holidays during the winter time are brutal. Halloween, be someone else. Thanksgiving, your family's going to judge you. Christmas, did I get them a gift? Do they like the gift? New Year's Eve, change your, who you are. Something's wrong with you. Come up with a resolution. Be different because you're bad. Valentine's Day, do you have anyone? And then Groundhog's Day, this is going to last for six more weeks. It's a really tough time. It's a really tough time for a lot of people. So again, when you see that time change happen, when we fall back and you go, yay, extra hours sleep, for a lot of people, this is a tough time of year. You gotta take that into account. Now, again, when it comes to depression and suicide, we gotta be honest with this. Overall, suicide numbers are down nationally compared to 50 years ago. They're starting to tick up a little bit. Social media sort of gets in that. We talked about that with adolescents, but depressed people are more at risk than the general population. White Americans are twice as likely to commit suicide as other races. White Americans are more likely to face depression than anyone else. Women are much more likely to attempt suicide, but men are twice as likely to be successful because they're using guns. Much higher amongst people who are wealthy, non-religious, and those who are single, widowed, or divorced. And you would think you're wealthy, why would you be more likely to be depressed if you're wealthy? Because when you don't have money, it's a great scapegoat. Why, you know, if I only had money, then you get money and you're still sort of, uh, what's your excuse? And it's harder for them. People who are non-religious, and I'm not saying go out and follow a religion, but when you have this belief that there's something or someone or whatnot in charge and you want to be faced with anything you couldn't overcome, it's a little bit easier to go through. Those who are single, widowed, or divorced don't have that support system. You know, one of the reasons that my wife's depression is better now is because of me, because I will sit there and I will listen and I care because I can't be happy until she's happy and she does the same thing for me. People are also more likely to commit suicide coming out of or going into a depression, not in the depths of it, because in the depths of it, you don't feel like you can do anything. It's going back into it, going, oh, I had one of these before. I don't like these. Or it's coming out of it going, whoa, geez, don't want that to happen again. That's the more vulnerable time of it. Again, you see there with seasonal affective disorder, the rates much higher up here out in the West in the North. Not so high when you come over here, 6.8, 8.6. These are two of the lowest. 
but also know that these areas are much more densely populated. So you've got more support. The more support you have, not as powerful seasonal affective disorder and some more there if you want to read about it some more stuff there about suicide as well now again we talked about this before non-suicide self-injury much more likely amongst teenagers with depression and again as we talked about with adolescents teens tend to act a little bit different you know my wife when she was depressed in high school uh one of the things she just wanted to do was not be a teen anymore so she started to do adult things where she would drink where she would go out where she would party because she would want to become numb you know again when you're depressed you're not feeling anything so you're taking all these risks to try to get some adrenaline rush and try to feel something so again risky behavior is a big sign of depression especially amongst young people she used to sit in class she would tell me she used to tell students this story. She would sit in class with a pencil and just sort of hit her thumb again and again and again and again and again. She would just sit in class and just hit her thumb. And it's like, well, that would hurt, right? She goes, yeah, that was painful. But at least I was feeling something because remember, depression is a numbness. She wasn't feeling anything. Ow, that hurts. At least you're feeling something. So when you take the little tack and you put it under your thumbnail and you push it, ow, 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 but at least I'm feeling something. And sometimes the self-injury is punishing yourself. I shouldn't be feeling this way. Why? You're bad for feeling this way. And you make those sort of bruises, whatever. Some Again, sometimes it's a distraction. Sometimes it's trying to get help, whatever else the case may be, but it is a sign of depression. Uh, some more stuff there on self-harm if you want to take a look at it there. Now, the other side of this is what is called a manic episode. So the depressed person feels like they can't do anything, but the manic person feels like they can do everything. You're euphoric, you're hyperactive, you're wildly optimistic. Let's go, let's go out, let's just go do stuff. There's only so many hours in the day. We gotta get as much crap in this day as we can because we gotta go, 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 go. Over talkative, overactive, elated, easily irritated if cross. It's like, hey man, let's go to Vegas. I don't wanna go to Vegas, man. You're bringing me down. If you're gonna bring me down, don't be a part of my life. You know, little need for sleep, racing mind. You know, because there's only so many hours in the day, you've got all this extra energy. You just want to use it up, use it up, use it up, use it up, use it up. And if people will go, well, wouldn't that be great to have that, to have all that energy and everything else? Not necessarily, because sometimes you're over-optimistic. You feel like you can take greater risks, which means risky sexual behavior, chances for disease, all these other things, you know, binge eat, all this stuff, because yeah, who cares about calories, whatever, you only live once, yo, yo. Or YOLO, uh, grandiose sense of purpose that you're very, very important. And everything revolves around you. Don't take care of anyone else. Spending sprees where it's sort of, oh, I just got to have this, have this, have this, have this, have this, that retail therapy, that sort of goes on. So then we get to what is called the bipolar disorder. And the bipolar disorder is when you combine the deep levels of depression where you can't do anything with the high highs of mania where you feel you can do everything because what goes up must come down in any sort of realistic settings so not only levels of extreme energy during mania but your optimism about yourself becomes unrealistically skewed due to the impending depression you know when if you're going through if you're a bipolar person and you're going through the manic stage and people are going would you just calm down i don't want to calm down because i know that depression is going to hit and i got to get everything in right now you know, so suddenly you're up at three in the morning, painting the hallway or whatever, rearranging furniture, trying to take control of your life. So a triggering event may cause a bipolar depressive episode to launch, but it alone is not the cause or the issue. What's the cause is genetic, more likely than not when we're talking about bipolar, okay? biologically and also environmentally predisposed. If one twin is bipolar, the other has a 70% chance of being diagnosed as well, whether they're raised together or raised apart. An event causing it would be rational. This is irrational. Again, it can lead to great creativity. Walt Moten and Vincent Van Gogh, Mark Twain, Edgar Allan Poe all looked back on their lives and most have been suggested that they must have been bipolar. And if you take a look at their biographies or bibliographies of, of their work, you'll notice that there are these periods of just immense stuff 
and there's these periods of their lives of nothing, no creation whatsoever. So you can see the mania and the depression, especially if you ever get a chance to go look at a Van Gogh exhibit. During that wild manic stage, you can see the darkness of his depression seep into his work. And it's really sort of moving uh, to take a look at. So there's two types of bipolar. I mean, I'm sure there's many types of bipolar, but the two types of bipolar that we're concerned with here are bipolar one and bipolar two. Bipolar one is the less common form of bipolar. Bipolar one is the classical highs, highs, low, lows, you know, you got a couple of weeks of depression, about a week or so of mania, and then you got a little bit of normal, then you go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And this is very easy to recognize because the extreme of the depression and the extreme of the mania, very, very, very less common. The more common form of depression, or I'm sorry, of bipolar disorder, about 1% of people have it less than 1% have bipolar one, but bipolar two is about 1%. These are patients that have depression followed by what is referred to as hypomania. And hypomania is mania that's not quite mania. It's not quite this dangerous euphoric thing. It just seems like really good days. It just seems like a few really good days. So this is harder to sort of diagnosed because is it just normal depression you're coming out and having some good days or is it just normally good days bad days it's a little bit harder to diagnose difficult responding to antidepressants as well and then that's the other trick when you're going through the manic stage why would you want to why would you want to take medicaid why would i want to take something to alleviate the highs i got to take advantage of the highs and again hypomania lasts a little bit less time than does, uh, than does uh, the bipolar. The bipolar can last a week. It could last three to six months of having that manic stage. And again, this two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, two months, you know? So again, when the person is oh, in such a bad mood this morning, now they're all happy. They're so bipolar, not even close not even close to what that is. Only 20% of bipolar cases are diagnosed within the first year of treatment because again, it just seems like there's these changes. Average five to 10 year delay between the original onset of bipolar and eventual diagnosis. And again, I know some teens are diagnosed with bipolar, but it's also tricky because when you're a teenager, your brain's not fully developed. So it could be something that looks like bipolar or looks like borderline person or looks like whatever, but until the brain is fully formed, we're not quite sure what it is. And then that also becomes the tricky thing about medication for a brain that's not fully formed. And we'll get into that whole to do in a couple of lectures when we talk about therapy. All right, so some things there on bipolar as well. Now, again, can you be bipolar and have some success? Sure you can. Sure you can if you're Iron Man, Robert Downey Jr., if you're Tim Burton, if you ever watched those movies. Uh, really kind of fascinating. Carrie Fisher, Mel Gibson, Kurt Cobain, Britney Spears, Kanye West, Robin Williams, Russell Brand, Johnny Mansell, Ben Stiller, Selena Gomez. Some successful people, but also some people that have had to battle some demons uh, in their life, you know, have had these sort of public episodes and everything else. The saddest, I mean, they're all sad. But Robin Williams breaks my heart. The guy just breaks my heart because he was just so talented and everything else. But this, this pressure on him to be Robin Williams, Mr. Entertainment. And, you know, and when he was in depression, he would try to self-medicate with drugs and alcohol and whatever else. And, and uh, right before he killed himself, he was coming out of the manic stage and he was going into the depressed stage and what was triggering the next depression was he had been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And he goes, how can I be the world's clown and have Parkinson's disease? It's not gonna work. And we lost him, you know, that was the going in. It was, that, was, that was the risky time. And you also know that he came out of the manic state because for the next couple of years after his death, you saw all these movies, hey, Robin Williams in, I thought he died a year ago. He put a bunch of them in the vault because he was in that manic state. He didn't want to stop working. You got to take advantage of that particular time, which just oh, breaks my heart. Breaks my heart of what all these uh, 
they have to go through. You know, just right now here in 2021, Britney Spears trying to reclaim control of her life. Uh, it's tough. It's tough. All right. So there's some more uh, people with bipolar there and just kind of the hypomania versus the mania and depression, mild depression, deep depression, whatnot. So how do we explain these mood disorders? Well, many behavioral and cognitive changes accompany depression. You're inactive. You feel unmotivated. You expect the negative. You look for the negative. You're going to get the negative. Most major depressive episodes, again, last less than six months. But stressful events can trigger them. A job, a marriage, a close relationship, things like that can all often precede depression, especially divorce. Divorce, if you take a look right here, separated, divorced men, separated, divorced women, yellow and red, look at how much higher it is than married men and married women. They're more likely to suffer from depression because you don't have that partner. You don't have that cheerleader next to you all the time. And again, it, it's great when you're in a marriage and it's, it, 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 it's, a, it's a healthy marriage. A bad marriage, get the hell out you know, get out. And again, that's where my wife for 20 years had various depressive episodes uh, when she was in this marriage to a guy who was just psychologically abusive, gaslighter, all these uh, sorts of things, a sociopathic, his, you know, tried to, tried to keep her in a weakened state because that way he was more able to control her. Women are more vulnerable to major depression than men because women are more likely to pay attention to their emotions. Again, guys, drugs and alcohol, they're not dealing with it. Uh, male disorders are more active, substance abuse, violence, aggression, things like that because they're trying to escape feelings. Men may also be underdiagnosed with depression because it's manifests itself as the anger and the aggression rather than sadness and hopelessness. Those are kind of their signs of it. So a lot of times when we just go, oh, well, his disorder is alcoholism. Well, it's alcoholism and depression. You know, maybe we should be looking at diagnosing it like that. Other ways that men and women differ in depression right there. Now, again, with each generation, the rate of diagnosed depression is going up and it is striking younger. So the question becomes, are we a more depressed society or are we simply diagnosing it more? And sometimes, and there's this question, are we over-diagnosing it? that suddenly when someone has a couple of bad days, it's like, oh, let's go get you help, let's get you medication and everything else when that might not necessarily be the right thing to do. Oftentimes, depression can be triggered. Usually people susceptible to depression have a significant event in their life that coincides with the onset of the first episode. And then when you throw the PTSD or whatever else in there with it, it can sort of bring back those haunting memories and whatnot. Now, genetic influences, again, bipolar, very much heritability, up to 85%. It's somewhere in the family tree. Depression, it's about 35% of it is going to have some sort of hereditary part to it. Uh, adopted children tend to reflect their biological parents more than they do their, um, their adoptive parents. So again, environment, not so much to do with it. Um, now, the depressed brain. Neurotransmitters are the key. Neuroephrine, serotonin, increases arousal, boosts moods, overabundant in mania, lacking during depression. As a matter of fact, one thing that people will say when you're going through depression is about serotonin levels. And one of the recommendations for depression is exercise. Go for a walk. You know, seasonal affective disorder. My wife was told when she was suffering from seasonal affective disorder to uh, go to a tanning bed, not to get tan and to get your bronze on, uh, it was to get the vitamin D, or is it B? It was D, whatever, for your skin, the UV light is very, very important. Uh, if you go for a walk, if you exercise, you're naturally going to give yourself a serotonin boost, a neoephrine boost, and that will help with your depression. And it's so easy to say, though. It's so simple to just go, well, you know what? If you're depressed, go for a walk, go for a run, get out, go for it, just, just go exercise. It'll get you over it. You don't even think you can get out of bed. It's going to take all your energy to tie your shoes. You want me to go for a run? That's asking a lot. That's asking a lot for someone who is walking through quicksand to just go for a walk. You know, to get it takes a lot to get that train moving. 
you know, to a train to go from stop to go, it takes a lot of energy to get that going. And that's what a lot of people who suffer from depression are doing. Prozac, Zoloft, Paxil are taken to block the reuptake of these neurotransmitters. Uh, so they'll remain. And again, we see anti-depression uh, prescriptions and medication going up. Now, again, we talked about this with the placebo effect. Is it truly the medication itself or is it the act of taking medication? And what we're starting to discover is a lot of antidepressants is the activity of taking it. Uh, has something to do with it. Oh, this should help. I'm feeling better, whatever. And then the other trick with taking antidepressants is antidepressants take about four to six weeks to take hold. You know, and if you're taking it for three, four weeks and nothing's getting any better, you're going to feel more depressed and it's going to take a, a, another boost. And then they're going to have to figure out what the right prescription is for you because they may give you a prescription in four to six weeks, it's not working. So they got to boost it or change it or give you a different medication. He was like, oh, medication doesn't work. And now you're getting more depressed. Or what could also happen is depression is a natural cycle of go down and come up. It's very possible that I could be at the bottom of the depression. I could be working my way up and it may not be the antidepressant that's making me better. It may just be the natural cycle that I'm coming out of too. Because a lot of people go through the ins and the outs of depression without ever knowing that they were depressed. Our body will naturally kind of heal itself there. So again, we're in the early stages in the last 30, 40 years of really studying this. So we got just as many questions as we have answers. But a lot of the cognitive explanations of, of depression is that we have negative thoughts. Depressed people tend to internalize blame. The events are forever. You know, this is going to last forever. You can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. If you see the light at the end of the tunnel, you think it's a train headed right for you. You think it's global that this little event, this little event that's triggered you off is going to affect everything you do. And it's your fault, you know, and this is why it's much more happy. It's much more likely to happen in an individualistic Western culture. Because an individualistic Western culture lacks the support that a collectivist one does. And negative moods feed negative thoughts. Depressed people sit there and they think about being depressed, which makes them more depressed. And it just becomes a cycle of rumination. Negative moods, negative thoughts. Sad people are more judgmental. Happy people tend to be more forgiving. Exercise, again, can help alleviate depression, go to the gym, but again, it's easier than it sounds. It's hard enough to get it going. So again, when I'm depressed, I have a decrease. I, I don't want to go out. I don't want to eat. I don't want to see my friends, which is going to increase my depression because I feel more alone, which is going to make me alienate my other, other people, which is going to put me into a deeper depression, which gives me inadequate reinforcement because I can't be around these people, which is more of a depression. And then when you're depressed, a lot of people don't want to be around you. <laughs> That's what's even worse. You know, your girlfriend broke up with you and now you're depressed and no one wants to invite you to the party because you're just going to go, Susie, not with me anymore, man. You're bringing the party down. So you become more isolated by your social group and your peers, which is why, folks, when you have a friend that's depressed, just be there. Just be around. Don't force them to talk. Don't force them to go for a walk. Just be available. Check in. Anything I can do for you? Don't ask them, how are you doing? Because then they got a sort of face with it. Just, can I do anything for you? What can I get for you? How can I make your day a little bit easier? What can I do for you? That's what you should do with a friend with depression. You should just, because it's a cycle. Can I just lift a little of that weight off your shoulder? What can I do for you? What can I do for you? That's all you ask. Of. That's all you need to be. And again, but again, this rumination, the ability to not only think about a problem, but you, but depressed people tend to overthink the problem, you know, and it's just a vicious cycle. And again, it's more likely to happen amongst women because women are more likely to think about what's going on there, uh, which is great. It can really, 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 really sometimes uh, be paralyzing. Sometimes we paralyze it. Okay, so that's depression. Uh, next lecture is going to be schizophrenia. And we're also going to talk about personality disorders. And you'll get the infamous, what is the difference between a psychopath and a sociopath? Not a joke. It's actually a difference uh, between a psychopath and a sociopath. Check in on that one. Next lecture.